All right. Thank you, everybody. My name is Hung Lu. I am with Cash Property Inc. And today I have a wonderful, super fantastic guest that I'm so happy to actually get to see because uh, I haven't seen him in a few months. And so I'm super happy to be able to do this question and answer. And I have a ton of questions because, Jenny, you were one of the people that I met. And I was like, oh my God, I want to pick his brain some more. So, before we get into the heart of the Q&A session, why don't you take a couple minutes and introduce yourself to the audience? You got it. Hi, Hong. Thank you for having me. I, um, yeah, I remember we were meeting at James Malinchek's program and uh, very impressed with you and what you were building. Thank you. The, uh, about me, it would be that um, short thing is uh, I started over at age 50 from broke after a couple divorces and a business failure. And I thought if I invest in multi-unit properties, that would probably help me so that I could have some decent retirement. And I started saving $500 a month until I had $18,000 to invest and bought a uh, triplex with two other people. I, I, Talk about wealth is a team sport, not a solo sport. So I didn't do it by myself. And from that, we ended up, oh, probably within about six to eight years, about 50, five, zero units. And at this point in life, uh, don't have to work for a living. I work as by choice. I donate 100% of the profits from the work I do to a charity. And... You know, those multi-unit properties set us up for life. And like I said, it was setting aside $500 a month to do this. Wow. So, all right. And before I forget, I am not a financial advisor. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an accountant. So all of the information that I'm presenting is really just my ideas, my advice, my opinion. So before you implement any of it, get somebody else's opinion on this show them my video and see what they say okay so just a little disclaimer there so so right off the bat i, I want to ask how did you save 500 dollars a month because <laughs> so many families struggle to even make it with the one paycheck or the two paychecks that they have like there's just no money left over right so how are you even able to save 500 dollars a month Thank you for asking that because it's crucial. And I just had a, a, a meeting the other day where I was talking to a group of people and one of the people said, one of the person said, no, you, you, you can't pay yourself first. That's the concept. It's 5,000 years old. It was working then. It'll be working when you and I are dust. And it's about treating yourself like you deserve to own some of the money you're working for, mm -hmm. which means you pay yourself first, before you pay your bills, before you reduce your credit card, before you pay your mortgage, before you pay your auto expenses or anything else. And people say, oh, well, yeah, I pay myself first. When I get my paycheck, I go to the grocery store and I buy food. I no, buy no, no, no. I paid the grocer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I, I was putting this $500 Whatever money came in, I was doing business coaching at the time. If I got a check for $100, I set aside 10. If I got a check for $500, I set aside 50. Okay. And it went into a separate savings account that I would be able to use for investing. Okay. And so I was also buying some individual stocks. 10, 10, 10% aside from everything coming in. And that 10%. Every, every dollar that came in. There are people who try and do it at the end of the month. And it doesn't work because it's too large of a number. But if you do it as the money comes in, it works. I was talking to someone in the internet uh, business, in the online business, okay. and he was saying, uh, he was reading in a book how on the 10th and the 25th of every month, he should set aside, you know, a percentage that came in. I said, no, that's too tough. He said, how often do you use your money? does your money flow in? He says, every day. So then at the end of every day, set aside a percentage. Okay. And you don't have to start with 10. You know, you start with one, two, three, five. That's fine. It's building that muscle of treating yourself like you deserve some of your money. Yeah. See, and that's already a great tip because a lot of people know about the pay yourself first concept. And a lot of people know about, you know, in order to pay yourself at the end of the month, they just, you know, set aside that money. 
But that's a really good tip is that you're doing it sort of as the money comes in. So whether it's daily, weekly, whenever that, that money flows in. So if you are working full time and you're getting a regular paycheck and you're saying every two weeks when you're getting your paycheck or on the 15th and the 30th, then that's when you pay yourself first. Yes, exactly. Think, think of it from the standpoint of dieting. Um, there are programs that say track your food every time you eat okay. because it creates the consciousness. And it, I mean, it wouldn't work to say, um, well, twice a month you can uh, diet. <laughs> no, no, no. It's got to be a daily routine. It's got to be a daily habit. So Okay. Okay. That's, that's a fantastic tip. And, and, and that's a, a way to further expand that pay, your, pay yourself concept. So that's great. So, so, so now here's, here, here's my next question about the $500, right? Because you were 50 years old and you started yeah. saving 500 at that point or did you, yes. were you already saving 500 from before? No, I'd finished uh, a second divorce and I had next to, I had probably less than $3,000 to my name. I had nothing. Okay. And, and so at 50, uh, I'm earning 5000 a month, okay. and it took me 18 months, no, excuse me, it took me three years to save $18,000. Yeah, I did that quick math on like three years. So then that means that your first multifamily that you uh, joined, ventured into was then when you were 53. That's correct. 53. That's okay. right. So what would you say to somebody who's, you know, at that age where they're like, they can't retire because they, they don't see that end of the road where they can safely retire, right? What would you say to those individuals who are like, I can't retire because I just don't have enough money. I have to keep working. Yeah. Well, the, the reality is it's never too late. Yeah. And I don't care if in my case, I was 50. I was, um, one of my clients had to start over and he was 68. And he had had a heart attack. Uh, he had had a real estate brokerage business. He lost it all. He lost his home. And he was surviving uh, in the United States on his social security check and his wife's part-time income. Wow. And I knew he had the knowledge, but he was emotionally feeling self, he felt defeated. And, you know, we talked about what he could do. And I said, let's get back to some of the habits you use to build your brokerage agency. Mm -hmm. And he started getting in contact with old clients. He started getting in contact with other referral sources. He started getting back on social media. And at this point, literally a month ago, he moved into his new home. Oh, that's great. He was able to buy a new home instead of having to pay rent to someone else instead of having to get scraped by where a, a bill of $100 would throw their whole budget out of whack and they would, you know, be bemoan, bemoaning their fate. And uh, I mean, he's got, I mean, it's just such a beautiful turnaround. But again, he, like he said, like I said, he started over at 68. So it's never too late. Okay. That, that, that to me is... It's amazing and also scary at the same time <laughs> because there are situations that come up that put you in that situation that you don't plan for, right? And so like in your situation, it was your second divorce, you said, right? And like, yes. you know, and, and you get married the second time and you, and you don't think about having to go through a second divorce, right? And so it's just, it's very nerve wracking to know that stuff like that can happen and it's out of your like you just can't plan for it, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, at this point, I mean, we have rescue dogs. As a matter of fact, like I said, 100% of the money I do for this work, I give to a charity. It's called uh, Shelter to Soldier. You see it right behind me here. Um, I have, I take my dogs in for regular dental checkups. Uh, and on the last checkup, the dentist said that, oh my gosh, one of these, one of her teeth is cracked. You need to have it removed. And I took the, the, to my regular vet, who I have a lot of confidence in, she said, yep, uh, the dentist is right. Um, we will need to remove this and it'll be $1,000. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, 
I don't think I spend a thousand dollars to have one of my own teeth removed. But this was unexpected. But then I looked at like, okay, not a problem. Thousand of bucks. I can do it. Right. Right. So 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 tell me a bit more about the shelter to to soldier program. Oh because uh, we don't absolutely. have that in Canada from what I yeah, you might, and you know, it might be a very small operation, uh, you know, or a company that's similar, or a charity that's similar. What they do is they rescue dogs from high kill environments. It could be dog shelters, it could be off the street. And if the dog has the right temperament and, um, the, and they're the right size, they can be trained as a service dog for soldiers who've come back with. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injuries, or something else. And the statistics in the U.S. are that the returning soldiers com commit suicide at the rate of almost one an hour. And dogs have a purpose in life, and they're euthanized at the rate of about 1,800 a day. Um, so you've got dogs that have a purpose in life. You've got soldiers who can't function when they come home. Right. And this organization trains the dogs to serve the, the soldiers. And not one soldier who's received a service dog has committed suicide. Well, what a great initiative. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll have to look into that. And, and that, that actually touches a personal note for me because my significant other is in the military. Right? And so uh, he's been on a couple of tours and you know like even right now while we're speaking he's actually deployed right now right and so I'm a single mom in you know in, in all the all, all those terms right but it but that really hits home because sometimes you know there's you know that's always at the back of my mind that you know when he comes back he you know there, there's yeah. a adjustment period on that right yeah he's he's away allowing you and everyone else to do the kinds of things that you do. And without that, you know, you wouldn't have the level of freedoms yes. that you get to enjoy. And they're not treated like the heroes they are when they come home. Mm -hmm. And this charity is saving two lives at a time. Wow. That's great. That's really, really great. So the other thing I wanted to ask you was when you purchased your triplexes, were they always with the same uh, individuals that you formed the partnership yes. with? Yes, the three of us uh, bought the uh, triplex to start with, then we bought uh, seven more units, um, five unit, another three unit. Uh, after about six years, we did a tax deferred exchange. I don't know if you've got that in Canada or something similar, but <laughs> we could sell the, the triplex and we had between the three of us, we had a, uh, let's see, uh, over a $500,000 profit wow. in the six years. Okay. And so it was all able to be transferred to a 15 unit property without any taxation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So up in Canada, we don't have that. Um, so that's one of the reasons why a lot of Canadians like to buy in the U.S. because then they can take advantage of that. We, we yes. don't have that in Canada, but we do have something like we have other taxation benefits, right? But yes, that tax deferred thing that you guys have in the U.S. is fantastic. Because when I heard about that the first time, I think about 10 years ago, I'm like, oh my God, it has to, it has to exist in Canada too, right? Like we're just as good as the U.S. And I did yeah. all my research. <laughs> and I did all my research and no, 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 no. Uh. Yeah, I mean, it, it is so beautiful because I mean, literally we, the $18,000 that I had saved up in the three unit grew to 130, that was my share. Then we went into the 15 unit building and we bought that for like 1.2 million. Uh, that's worth like 2.8 at this point. So, uh, and we bought the third party out by the way, several years ago okay. so that at this point, the 18,000 I saved is roughly worth uh, $600,000 or something. Right, right. Or more, uh, you know. No, well now we have, now my wife and I have half that building. It has a, I don't know, it has a million and a half, uh, about seven or 800,000 dollars. 18 okay. into, 18 turns into yeah. $800,000. Yeah, talk about leveraging to the max here, right? 
So now yeah. here's here's my, my next question because a lot of people will ask me this, like um, a, a lot of my coaching clients will ask me, at what point do you stop leveraging, right? So at what point, so right now with me, like, you know, as soon as I have enough equity, I'll take that out and buy another property or I'll fund another private deal, right? And so it's yeah. constantly leveraging, leveraging, leveraging. And yes. the last couple of questions that I had from two of my clients were, Hong, at some point, when are you going to stop? <laughs> okay. And, and here, here's my answer. And, and it's a tough answer because, <coughs> excuse me, most people can't determine when they have enough. enough. Yes. And uh, you're young, you can keep doing it. I'm 71 years old. I'm tired. And so I've stopped at this point doing anything that involves me having to be active. So the investments that I make now are passive. I'll invest with other people, whether they be developers, whether they, maybe it's, I'm in another limited partnership or an LLC, okay. uh, being run by someone else. Uh, they're, all, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, all sorts of things that are very passive now. Yes. Uh, I managed the properties that we bought when we had 50 units. Wow. And we st I've sold stuff off. I've gotten triple net leases and we're down to 27 units. And that's enough so that my wife says, you still have something to do. <laughs> and, um, but it's not much. I mean, it takes me a couple hours a week to deal with everything regarding the, the properties. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. And you know, it's funny because well, first off, you look fantastic for somebody in their 70s. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And I've been in real estate for 20 years now. And so I've actually moved away from buying properties. Now, my last one, my, my last purchase last year was a fourplex. But then after I bought that, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm done with actually buying properties. I'm, I'm now at 16 doors. So I'm going to stay at 16. And now I'm doing the peer-to-peer -peer lending, right? And I find that that is the best use of my time right because i love the tenants that i have and it frees up a lot of my time to do other things so that i'm not dealing with property management and dealing with tenant issues and so forth like that so you know surprisingly you don't need to wait until you're in your 60s or 70s to move away from property acquisition exactly right. so, yeah. and I, I look at it, i've actually been um toying with the idea of buying something out of state maybe 30 40 units and then having a management company and managing the management company yes. uh, just for the experience of it, because I don't have to do it, but I thought, eh, why not? let's try that too. Okay. Oh, oh there's one of your dogs. <laughs> I closed the doors so they're not real noisy, and fortunately I did. Oh, gosh, I, I love dogs. So we actually dog sit for families in the area, so. <laughs> oh, I, I'm dog sitting for my daughter's dog besides R2. Yeah. That's fantastic. So yeah. now let, let me ask you this because I know that your wife. Um, ah, single parent <laughs> issues are coming up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so I know that your wife um, is a huge supporter of the real estate buying um, strategies. And, you know, when I first heard about how you guys met and your relationship and, you know, up until the point that you guys got married, I'm like, oh my gosh, she, she must be an amazing person because, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? because, because you two connected when you had no money. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right? That was something I actually had to keep under wraps for a while because you know, here I am 50 years of age. She's self-sufficient when we meet and it's sort of like, oh my gosh, she's meeting a man who has no resources. Is this what she wants in her life? Okay. And I, I probably lasted about mm, six weeks before I was able to tell her, hey, I'm starting over from scratch. I don't have much, but she did have a sign of it. Um, we were, oh gosh, I think, yeah, I think Charles or someone mentioned this because I told the story, which I hadn't told before. And that was, we had passes to the movie because it was free and she wanted to get something to eat like a burrito before the movie. 
and I didn't have the $3 it took to buy her burrito. And that was the first sign to her that, wait a second, something's wrong here. Would, he doesn't have $3 to pay for my burrito. Um, and then I realized, you know, I'm going to have to fess up and tell her where I am financially. I'm starting over, you know, I may have lost money, but it didn't mean I lost what I know how to do things. And, you know, we had enough of a connection at that point. She said, well, if this is how it is the rest of our life, am I willing to accept it? Cause I really love him. Um, and she said to herself, yes. And now we're in a situation where, you know, we don't have to work again and we won't outlive our money for the rest of our life. Right. Right. And, and that's a really interesting thing to take away because once you get the knowledge of anything, right, you have that knowledge forever, right? And you can yes. use it, reuse it, pass it on to your kids and so forth. Right. And, and, and that was one of the things that I took away from your book because I could, you told me that story before and I love that story. Um, and I remember, you know, after you told me that and I was doing some other self-development stuff and that really came to become a really, um, interesting thing for me to learn because one of the things that I was always fearful about was, okay, I've made this net worth at my age to be able to retire from engineering. I've, I'm now traveling for almost a year with my son. You know, and so I'm doing a lot of things that people my age just cannot do financially, right? right? And so yeah. I have that financial stability to be able to do this stuff. And one of the things that I was always really fearful of is what if I lose all of my real estate? What if I, you know, lose my net worth, like all of this, right? And I get down to zero, right? Again. And after hearing you and a couple of other people tell me like, hey, you know what, Hong, once you get the knowledge, you can always make that money back, right? And so, so that was so important. Like that, that, that was one of the things that I took away from you when we met what, a year and a half ago or something like that. Right. And, and that, that was a really like, um, it kicked that fear out of me because I, I now don't have that fear. Right. Because I know that if I lose whatever money I've already made, I can always get that money back. I can always, you know, figure out another way to buy a property and so forth. And that's one of the things that I tell my mortgage clients, right? Like um, people will hire me to teach them how to pay off their mortgage in 10 years. And I'll tell them like, hey, you know, what? once you know this, even if you don't pay it off in 10, you can pay it off in 15. And this information you can pass on to your kids, right? And then once you know this, you buy a rental property, do it on your rental property. And then buy your third property, do it on your third property. And so this knowledge just keeps going, which is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely right. And that was one of the things that was one of the fears that I had when I was younger. Um, I didn't feel I had the ability to rebuild. Uh, I was concerned about what happens if I, you know, lose my home or whatever. And after my first divorce and I was, you know, half my net worth was gone. Uh, it was sort of like, and, and I, I went, oh, let's see, no, I, I, I have it backwards. Uh, let's see, 81, 82, seven years before my divorce, I went broke in the art business. Okay. And, and my wife at the time was not a partner. Uh, her comment to me was, you got us in this mess, you have to get us out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not helping you. <laughs> so that, that wasn't much of a marriage. Uh, we, that's why it ended seven years later. But what I realized when I'd gone broke that first time and was able to rebuild it before our divorce, I said, oh, that fear I had of going broke, I'm not concerned about because I saw that I was able to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. And so I had that horrible fear and then I found out that yeah, it's not real. You know, I guess that false evidence appearing real is the act, you know, turns out to be the acronym FEAR. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. So now you raise a really good point that I want to ask you about because um, I, I read your book through and through and I love it. And so that's Thank why you. I'm like, I constantly promote it to everybody that I know and say, hey, you can get a copy of this for free. Just go to this link, right? 
So the one thing I want to ask you, because I get that I get this question a lot from some of my coaching clients, is if if there's a couple and one person is um, willing to do the work to fix their financial situation, but then their partner is not, and they're at a different mindset, you know, different everything. So how would you address that? It's, um, I don't think the people who are in that situation are going to like my answer. (laughs) But the reality is that's not a match that's going to sustain uh, a happy life. Mm -hmm. Um, The bottom line is a couple that stays together and enjoys each other's company and supports one another are couples that have the same values. And if one of the uh, couples uh, wants to save and invest and grow their wealth and the other person in the uh, relationship wants to spend the money and spend it all now and enjoy the high life and, and, and prevent the future accumulation of wealth, it's a relationship that's not going to work long term. Mm-hmm. And just yesterday, I was speaking with someone who had just gotten divorced. He's 61 years of age. And he finally came to the realization he will never have anything if he maintains himself in that relationship because all she wanted from him was to be the the meal ticket. Um. And that's, it was all about her. And it could be in reverse as well, where the wife wants to do things and all the husband wants to do is spend money on stuff. I've seen it both ways and long-term it just can't work. And one way or another, you need to have a partner who has the same values that you have. And that's for a long, happy life. My, my final wife and I have been married for uh, 20 years. And we still adore each other and support each other. And we were just talking about that last night. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, one, one of the things that I, you know, when I have coaching clients that are in that situation, there's only so much I can give them direction on, right? And then at some point, yeah. they need to come to that conclusion on their own, right? Yeah, you um, can't tell them, uh, you know, get a divorce. No, you, you can't say that. It's, just, it's not going to go over well. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, one of the things that I, I try to do is I, I, you know, because a lot of times they ask me, like, do I need to bring my significant other into the meeting, right? And at that point, I just said, you know what? If they're willing to come, then bring them, right? If, even if they sit there and don't communicate, don't do anything, even if they sit there and some of that information goes through, at some point, something's going to click, right? But if yeah. they're fighting you that entire time, then don't bring them, right? Like, you know, have the conversations when you get home, but don't bring them. You come, let's get the information knowledge sharing between me and you. You do what you can do at the home, but let's just focus on you building as much wealth as you can. I actually uh, request the partner be a part of the meeting, even if there's uh, animosity or difficulty, because then what happens is it brings up the differences to the surface for both people, and they can see what's not working because they got a neutral third party who's not invested in their situation, talking about what works and what doesn't work, and then each partner can see it's not a match, but when they're at home and it's private and they're arguing and no one sees it, then it's, then they can just keep on doing that same thing and they may not be willing to address it. Yeah. That's a very um, good point. We just saw, I, my wife and I saw a, a, a special on TV last night. I mean, this is the extreme. Okay. Um, cause my wife had met the comedian Phil Hartman because at one time she was in the entertainment business and Phil Hartman Uh, was killed, uh, it's 21 years ago, by his wife, who then killed herself. And I'm only bringing it up to say, that's how bad it can get when there's a mismatch of values. Ah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's prevent that early on. (laughs) Okay, I don't know where to go with that now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I, I could bring in some wild stuff. But I mean, you know, so yeah, have them both come in, have them both recognize what's working or not working. Mm-hmm. And, 
and bring it up and then send them to a marriage counselor or something like that. And I've actually made that suggestion to some clients in the past that mm -hmm. I think it's appropriate that you see a marriage counselor. This is beyond my, it's not beyond my abilities, but it's sort of like, I don't want to deal with this. This is mm -hmm. not what I'm talking to you about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, so I totally get that. Um, Perfect. So let me ask you all these questions before <laughs> the call gets dropped or something happens crazily. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. so the, the question that I wanted to ask you the last time that I, I had asked and where our call got dropped was I wanted to ask you about single family properties versus multifamily properties. Because from what I gathered, you have only done multifamily. Is that correct? That's correct. My wife had a couple of rental houses, okay. and I have a bias against them. Okay. So that, that, that's more of my question is, if somebody were, wanted to get into real estate and sort of, you know, the ground is open in terms of getting into single family and multifamily, what direction or tips would you give them in terms of, okay, how do they decide? Do they go single family or multifamily? Um, I would say they go multifamily. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's no reason to go to single family houses okay. and there's several reasons for it. Uh, the primary one has to do with uh, income and expenses. If you have a single family house and it's rented out uh, and hopefully the rental income is covering all your expenses, that's fine. And then as soon as that tenant moves out, you have no income and 100% mm -hmm. of your expenses. Yes. Okay. That, I think that's a waste. That, there are other reasons in terms of if you have a bunch of single family houses, you have you know, maybe several gardeners, several roofs, several plumbing systems, several mm. electric, on and on and on. And the, the value of the single family house has nothing to do with the rental income. Mm. So now we'll talk about multi-units. Okay. I don't care if you're talking about two, three, four or larger. Uh, we use the three unit as an example. Okay. One of the tenants moves out. You still have two thirds of your income yes. to handle the expenses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's the first example. You only have one roof to deal with, one electrical system to deal with, one plumbing system to deal with. It's just so much more efficient. And the value of the multi-unit is tied to the rental income. Yeah. So if I increase the rental income on the property, that immediately increases the value when I want to sell it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to do with all the emotions about what color the, the carpet is or any of the rest of that thing. <laughs> Yes. So now, if, if somebody is just starting off and they're looking at, you know, both options, right, because both of them are available, and they don't know if they want to deal with tenants yet, so they, you know, so starting off with maybe a smaller building with maybe two units is still better, right, than dealing with having only a single family, because at least now you've got two rental incomes coming in, but now at least if they don't like dealing with tenants, it's easier to offload anyways a duplex than it would be potentially a single family unit. Exactly. And, uh, and buying a duplex, let's say they wanted to move into one of them because they don't have a home yet. Well, that means the other tenant is paying half the mortgage for them. I mean, there's so yes. many advantages to the multi-unit. Uh, yes, that's, that's actually a good point because that's how I actually got my first property was I house hacked. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, it works out. Yes, absolutely. So, so, so that's, that's really good, um, good, good advice as to, you know, if, if somebody's debating about doing single family versus multifamily, right, and, you know, the things to consider on that. Um, and you're absolutely right, uh, the last four plaques that I bought, I couldn't rent out one of the units because of some zoning issues. So luckily for me, I had three rental units that I could rent out out of the four, and those three covered all the expenses, so I wasn't out of pocket, right? And if I was in a single family unit or even uh, like a duplex where there were some issues, I, I, I would have had some financial issues with that particular property. Exactly. Yeah, so, absolutely correct. Yeah. So, yeah, all you're doing is saying the same thing I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that's perfect. Wait, a lot of um, people who watch the videos, they like to get the information, not coming from me, but from somebody else. And you have so much experience here, right? And so I'd like to at least have you give the advice in a different way, 
right? And and I found that really important. Like when I was reading your book, the content in there, I was reading and I'm like, oh my God, this sounds like something I've heard before, but it makes so much more sense now, right? And so just the way you write, the way you communicate, um, you have an ability to convey the idea in a different way that is so much more easier to understand. Oh, thank you, Hung. One of the You're welcome. things is, um, you know, I, I say that I have to do things in a simple way because I'm mm -hmm. simple. And then my wife mm -hmm. also says I'm simple. Uh, <laughs> so that it works out perfectly. Oh, that's awesome. So now, um, okay, so that's fantastic. So now I know that you have a TED Talk coming up. Is that right? Do, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, I'm very excited about that. Um, yeah. I'm going to be speaking on philanthropy and okay. the idea that a lot of people think that uh, creating wealth is bad and the reason for it is they've been influenced by Hollywood movies or TV shows yeah. or fairy tales or Charles Dickens or, or the scripture. It, all these influences which give the impression that the only kind and noble people are poor and the wealthy people are greedy and heartless. And people don't want to be heartless. They don't want to appear greedy. So they shun the opportunity to become wealthy. And the reality is the wealthiest people on the planet are the biggest philanthropists on the planet. You can't have a huge impact in philanthropy when you're poor. You can't pour from an empty cup. So it's like those individuals who say that they want to solve hunger, but then they don't have the financial resources to at least initiate that process or be involved in the conversation of how to go about doing that. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if they're okay. feeding themselves mm. and their family, how, in the world, how can they talk about solving hunger in the world? Yeah, yeah. So now you raise a, a good question that I'd like to ask you. What is one of the um, money stories that you were telling yourself in the past that you worked yourself through and now you don't have that money story anymore? Um, it, well, one of them had to do with having to do things by myself. Mm -hmm. And I was raised as a latchkey kid. I came home. There were no parents. It was up to me to take care of myself. And the problem is that you have the, the, the mentality of a five or seven year old kid running an adult and it doesn't work efficiently or effectively. Okay. And what I learned in my 40s was that one, it was okay to ask for help. And number two, the success comes from allowing other people to support me. So I have an expression and it's called wealth is a team sport, not a solo mm -hmm. sport. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to adopt to create the level of wealth I have. I didn't buy the first property by myself. My wife and I had a third partner. Mm -hmm. uh, we continued buying together until we went from the original three units we bought to 50 units yeah. in a matter of like six to eight years. Wow, that's fantastic. So now I, I did want to ask you a bit more about how you found your third partner, uh, like your wife obviously, but your third partner. And what characteristics does that third party bring to the table that you really would suggest that anybody getting into real estate and wanting to do a JV needs to at least consider? Um, well, the advantage is he was in real estate. Okay. Um, he was in real estate for a long time, so he had that experience. Uh, we had a separation of responsibilities in that he found the properties he suggested what we could do to improve them. He had relationships with um, roofers and painters and handymen and things of that nature. And so I, my responsibility was finding the tenants, taking care of the tenants, collecting the rents, doing the accounting and things of that nature. And my wife's responsibility was to stay away. <laughs> So is she considered a silent partner, like where she has no say in any of the decisions and stuff? So she's just more of a, a, a like on the paper? Well, two of the people, my, uh, okay. I'll call him Robert. Robert and I uh, okay. had all of the, de made the decisions and okay. my wife would provide input. 
And okay. so she, she did have a voice in the process, okay. but Robert and I would ignore it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so now just to clarify, so Robert, was he a real estate agent or a broker? Okay. Agent. Yes. Okay. And when you said that he was able to find the properties because he had a lot of experience in that, did you already have um, a friendship relationship with him prior to going into the JV with him, or was he uh, was a brand new? For a few years through my husband, through, through my husband. I knew him for a few years through my wife because okay. this was her real estate partner. Oh, okay. So, so she had already done work with him, and so there was already an existing relationship and trust already there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Because I, I know that. You know, there's always that discussion of building the right team, and real estate agents love it when they're part of that team, right? So it's vital that we choose the right real estate agent to be a part of our team, and a lot of the times the investor is the agent, right? Yes. And, and the reason for that makes a lot of sense because when the realtor is putting skin in the game, mm -hmm. they're wanting to be sure it is the best possible property and it's going to be in a good area and no one's going to get taken advantage of in the purchase. Why? Okay. Because they are a part of it. Okay. All right. So now when you guys set up the initial JV, um, was it split, you and your wife was 50% and he was another 50 or was it 33 something? That, that no, is okay. how we did it. He had half and my wife and I had half. Okay, okay. And then is there anything within the uh, JV contract in terms of suggestions or tips or learning that you had in the past that you would um, want to share with everybody? Um, yeah, it would probably be that you, whatever agreements that you come up with, that mm. you put them in writing. And that okay. avoids misunderstandings and upsets down the road. Uh, and that's the whole point, is to yeah. avoid misunderstandings later. Because there's always the opportunity to say, well, no, wait a second. I did, that's not what I understood. Or he said or she said. You, you avoid that when you have a written agreement. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's fantastic. And so now you guys have been in this joint venture partnership for we continued it ten for years. Eight years. Yeah, eight years. Okay. For ten years. Yeah. And then um, one. Gosh, I should change the name for this podcast. But one of the people was diagnosed with a. Um, a disorder that caused a difficulty in maintaining the relationship. Okay. And so, okay. So we bought out the third partner. Okay. So you bought out the third partner. Okay. And 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 you raise a good point with that because at some point you do need to revisit the partnership. You do need to revisit the terms. You know. And so it's good to have some exit strategy in place. Exactly. Right. Yeah. We didn't have an, an efficient exit strategy in place, so okay. what we did is we went to a neutral third party who had experience in dividing up real estate among partners, and he was able to guide us through the process, and it okay. went smoothly because we, again, we had a, ne a neutral third party uh, to support us. Okay, so, so there's actually companies out there that do mediation then, right? Okay. Yes, oh wow, I had no idea that type of work even existed. That's fantastic. So now, so, so that type of company, are they real estate uh, specific or not really just sort of business related and so then they're able to help that? It was uh, an accounting firm okay. that was uh, very much in the real estate space. Okay. Uh, he actually did training for one of the largest uh, real estate operators in the country, okay. Marcus and Millichap. Okay. And so I figured if they brought him in to train their agents, this would probably be someone appropriate to help us get through okay. the situation. And it, okay. like I said, it worked out very well. That's fantastic. So now in your JV contract, was there a clause in there about how to resolve conflict or something like that so that it did allow you guys to get a third party? That's no, what, that's okay. That's what was missing. And that's, that's what I was going to say. Ah. Wow, okay. Okay, that, that is a very important tip to bring up. Okay, I will make sure that we take note of that. Exactly. So, okay. so 
it's not only how are you going to be operating together, but mm -hmm. in the event you want to separate, how will you be doing that? So right. if you want right. to have your exit strategy as a part of your initial agreements, it's similar to a prenuptial agreement. Mm -hmm. which talks about if the married couple isn't going to get along anymore, how do they separate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you do the, the prenuptial when you're still in love and not when there's problems. <laughs> I'm taking it from somebody who's been married several times. <laughs> <laughs> You're referring to me, I take it. <laughs> yeah, because I haven't actually been married yet. I've been proposed to several times, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I learned a lot by the third time. <laughs> <laughs> so now, Lenny, tell me, how can people get in touch with you? What, what, what's, what's the best way to do that? Really simply. Um, if they go to my website, which is wealthonanyincome.com, okay. not only can they get in touch with me through that, but they can even get a thousand dollars worth of free business building tools, how to ask okay. for referrals, uh, how to okay. work with your mate if you're, you want to have conversations about money and you'd like it to be a safe space. Uh, all of these things are free on the website if they just okay. ask for them and They'll get an email from me thanking them for uh, taking advantage of that, and then we'll be in communication. Okay, that's perfect. So now I will also put all your contact information in the bullet that I write up, so it will be available as well for if they're not actually paying attention while they're listening to this, they will be able to find the information. Yeah, oh, so, and you'd mentioned yeah. the book. They can actually get a free yes. summary of my book from the website oh. as well. How come I have a link for the free whole book? Um, ask me. Do you not want me to do that? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you you purchased my whole book, uh, uh -huh. but if you wanted just a three-page summary, you could have that for free. Oh, I thought it was actually the whole book that was for free on that link. Oh, I never actually. Oh, okay, okay. So three-page summary. What I okay. found is that. Um, when I when I offered the free book in its entirety years ago, uh -huh. yes. one person out of three hundred read it, so it was really uh, totally in a waste. People can read a three page summary; they're not going to spend the time to read read a two hundred page book. Right, I did. Yes, because Which I found it great. <laughs> Well, once I started reading it, I couldn't put it down. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Oh, I understand this. And then, so I just kept going. Right? So, but, so you do raise a good point, but because my mortgage freedom book in 10 years um, is about 200 pages, and I give that away for free, it, like on, 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 um, on my website, and, and I wonder how many people actually do read it, right? Because the information is all out there. It's just how you implement it, right? Exactly. And, so, okay. Um, it's probably very few people actually read the whole book. It would probably be better uh, yeah. to give a three-page summary okay. of that information, and then they can buy the book. And the other part of that Ooh. is that 100% um, of the profits from my book, from my coaching program, yeah. Uh, yeah. all of that, I donate to charity. So it's a way for me to raise money for the charity as well. And gotcha. Again, when someone puts some skin in the game, they're more likely to take some action. Right, right. And so, as I heard this quote recently, um, those who pay, pay attention. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I would agree with that quote. <laughs> and I can't remember who told me, but it, it, it's not my quote, but, so, so I can't take any credit for it. So, all right, thank you so very much. I really love seeing you again, and thank you. It's, I, I am so, so sorry about all the IT issues. It's, like, insane. Like, I got some right here in the whole process of trying to figure it all out, so, yeah. We got it. We're connected. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I will also see you on our mastermind session coming up, and I'm so looking forward to all of the participants um, getting a chance to meet you and asking you some questions and just having you, you know, provide some input on their challenges because that's what we do at the mastermind is help them get through the next month of how to get more real estate and get into real estate. Terrific. Yeah. I will be there to support them, and it'll be my pleasure. Awesome. Also, and good luck on the TED Talk.
Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's coming along well. Um, I'm getting okay. to give it to service clubs like Rotary, and that helps okay. me practice so that it makes it easier oh, for me to memorize. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, not yeah. that good at memorizing, and you know, I know the material, but it's different okay. when you actually have to memorize something. You got 12 yeah. minutes or 14 minutes, whatever it is, and, and the clock doesn't stop. Like it just keeps going and going as soon as yeah. That's intense. <laughs> okay, so I will give you the opportunity to say the last words. Um, what would you like to say to the audience? Um, that wealth creation is a team sport, not a solo sport. And whether you enroll the support of Hong or your CPA or an attorney or a business partner or a realtor, this is best when you're doing it with other people and not by yourself. I love that. It, it's a great message to take away. That's awesome. Thank you so very much. You got it. Bye -bye. Hi, I'm Hong with Cash Property Inc. We help you, regardless of age, financial situation, and education, get as much money as you want. If you like our video, please click on the like button below and subscribe to our channel.